Well, welcome back, everybody, uh, to House Corporation Essentials, the X's and, X's and O's of supporting the facility and those who live within it. If uh, we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Scott Pusell. I'm the, the host of House and Home, and I'm also the Director of Education for CSL Management. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm going to be doing the best I can to manage the chat conversation today, uh, kind of pinch hitting for Christina, who's not going to be with us today. But uh, so if you have a question along the way, please jump in the chat and fire away and we will do the best we can to get to those conversations and to those questions as we are having uh, this session together, as we're sharing together today. Yeah. For the questions we don't get during the middle of the session, uh, we do have some time set aside at the end of today's session uh, to answer those outstanding questions. And if we don't get to them during uh, that time, during that Q&A session, um, we will let everybody go who's got a hard stop at 1.15 and then Woody and Steve and I will stay on the call as long as we need to to make sure that you get the, the rest of your questions answered. So uh, one thing that would be a huge help for me right now, if everybody could mute yourselves, that would be a gigantic help. And uh, if you have questions, uh, just jump in the chat and ask your questions there. That just helps us manage the, uh, the conversation a little bit easier and some of the background noise. So uh, here's what we're going to cover today. We have a lot to get through, but we it's all super fantastic information, and we're grateful that you spent some time with us uh, to go through this because we think we've got some essentials, some fundamentals that are really going to help add to what we shared last week. And here are a few things that you guys I uh, have to look forward to today. We're going to cover what happens when, get into crisis, disaster, recovery, or preparedness a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about getting your financial house in order and meal plan management, uh, building and leading a, a team and investing in them, how we can support the teams that support our facilities, that support our students. And then we're going to talk about some of the incentives for, for, for living in. And uh, we'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, one of the things I'm excited to share today is Woody's back with us. Uh, he was our special guest last week, and we're excited to have Woody back to share and carry the, do the majority of the heavy lifting today. Uh, he's the managing partner here at, at CSL Management. For those of you who haven't had a chance to meet Woody, and is a chapter brother of mine uh, at Middle Tennessee State. And uh, as I mentioned last week, this is kind of part two of a kitchen sink kind of presentation. We are throwing a lot at you. We are throwing everything but the kitchen sink at you. So a uh, lot to cover in the next, let's see, it's 12.08. Uh, next, oh, numbers is hard. They make my head hurt. Uh, I do know that that was grammatically incorrect, by the way. So in the next hour and six minutes, we've got a lot to cover. So let's dive right in and talk about what happens next. What happens next? So here's a question for you. Uh, we have been going through a lot this year. So what I would love for you guys to do is to jump in the chat and share, okay, what are the crises, the crises? What are the disasters that we need to be uh, thinking ahead on? What are the disasters that we need to be prepared for uh, either externally or internally uh, when it comes to the support of our chapter houses? Jump over into the chat and tell me your list of the top three or four or five things that we've feel like we need to be prepared for from a disaster perspective. Love to see your responses there before we dive into what we have to share today. So your top four or five disasters, what should we uh, what should we be prepared for? Spoiler alert, we've been in one for six months, by the way. So Love this fire, earthquake, water flooding. That's fantastic. It's funny how parts of our country uh, preparing for an earthquake was not even on my radar screen until um, I started working for for CSL, and then we started to realize, oh, we've got properties on the west coast. We've got to be aware of that. So love that. Thank you, Layla. Uh, Doug's jumping in here. Yeah, the penalty of a house closure, COVID restrictions. Yeah, all of that. So. Tornado, absolutely. I know it seems like, uh, especially the last few years in the Midwest and in the South, uh, we've had a huge tornado, um, uh, huge tornadoes, huge storms, more severe storms coming through, uh, spe specifically the Midwest and the Southeast, and uh, love all this. Yeah, so these are great, great uh, additions to our conversation here, so I appreciate everybody sharing. Um, Woody, what's on... Uh, What's on your list? What are some of the things that you would encourage yeah. our groups to be prepared for? Yeah, so it was what, uh, Scott and I were preparing and talking through some of the 
of these things, especially with Christina, who's on the front lines many times uh, on many of these disasters or crisis when they arrive, You're trying to, uh, we could spend probably two, three, four hours uh, when it comes to disasters and crisis. And, and what we know as an industry, right, our game, if you will, for many, uh, almost decades now has been been pretty sharp, uh, whether it is an unfortunate issue with a something happening to a member at one of our facilities or anywhere on campus, if you will, and, and, and what we have to do and how we react with that and our national organizations providing step by step uh, measures, step by step policies, procedures that we should be following if or when that happens. We certainly have spent a lot of time and money and resources on risk management. Uh, both at the men and women's level and what we should be doing uh, in any situation and trying to manage our risk and whether it's taking a event off campus or, or out of the house and what that looks like and our formals and things of that nature. But when we look at today and, and disasters, it's just fascinating and crisis of our facilities and what we should be focusing on and looking at it. Both of you, uh, those of you on this call today, both as house directors and the volunteers that are uh, managing uh, the day-to-day -day operations, if you will, of these facilities, when a crisis hits or a disaster hits, it, it has really changed uh, in, in the frequency, the severity, and the different elements of it. If you look at just right now, uh, yesterday, uh, the fires in Colorado advanced, uh, I don't know, it was, of an ungodly amount of miles, I think over 100 miles or whatever that it was advancing. And we were, we're sitting there near the campus of Boulder. And what do we need to be doing? And if you look at just at campuses like Berkeley and San Jose and the fires that have been happening in Northern California and air quality, and when do we need to really truly worry about evacuating our members? Or as Shanna was saying in the chat, as a uh, someone in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, like she is, the tornadoes that just hit there a couple of years ago. So there's all these different, uh, uh, I don't know if they're diff necessarily different disasters, but the magnitude and, and the frequency in which we're seeing these. Uh, and then you throw in a pandemic. Then you throw in the last couple of years, we had several conversations about active shooters on campus and bullets going through sorority houses and different elements. So pointing all of these out because we know um, as an organization and as uh, house directors and volunteers and stuff we we typically have our life safety game in order these days more often than not but what is really key and what we would re remind us and as we're again the goal of the last session and today's session is dusting off just the basics, if you will, and the reminders as we've been so focused the last seven or eight months on COVID-19, we've got to we've got to remember there's other business at hand. And when it becomes to disasters, when it comes to crisis, there are certain things that we just got to make sure that we have that we understand what our national organizations' policies and procedures are. They're readily available. They're typically straight to the point and easy to comprehend and implement into our local strategy, if you will. How are you going to prepare for each one based on the region and where you live? Which ones are more risk to you than others? Certainly, if you're uh, out west or uh, in the southwest, not a lot of risk for tornadoes, but you're going to have fires. Maybe not a ton of risk for hurricanes, but you're going to have certainly earthquakes that could yield other challenges in that scenario. We've seen even for our Florida chapters or those in Southern uh, Mississippi and Southern Alabama, the hurricanes and, and the activity that's going there. Have you pulled out your disaster preparedness and have you looked through it and talked through what are the game plans for moving members out of the house and getting them to safer scenarios? Are you utilizing technologies that are there that are out there with our cell phones to where we can communicate uh, better? That was one of the big things when we were helping some of our clients navigate the tornado in Alabama you would be surprised the number of parents that call the fraternities and sororities versus the university or anywhere else trying to find their students or find their children, I'm sorry. So they, they do look to the, those organizations to help them in locating them. So do we, have we looked at the different technologies and there's a lot, group me and other different things. I mean, just go ask the students, they'll set it up for us in about 30 seconds, but make sure you have clear uh, rules, expectations, 
numbers, emergency numbers, where we can go, uh, what we need to do in the event of each situation that may or may not happen to our house. And so if you haven't really taken a close look at that in the last really five to 10 years, a lot of times we've developed these plans, we put them on a shelf, we save them in a Google Doc and we don't look at them. So we would just encourage you today, uh, this is our only slide on this that we're gonna be talking about emergencies and disaster preparedness. It's just recognizing that the frequency, the severity uh, of the natural disasters that are coming at us have certainly changed. The types of crisis that we're dealing with uh, versus un, you know, and a tragedy to our members, unfortunately, that still happen from time to time. But now we have pandemics, active shooters, uh, a lot of the mental health stuff that we've been talking about. Now is the time to really look at your global life safety plan, your global disaster plans, your global crisis plans, if you will, and make sure the house corporation, your alumni advisors, your staff, your team, and really the chapter members are all clear on what we're going to do for when one of these things may impact your facility directly. Scott, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, let me just add one thought there, yep. Woody. Sure. Uh, there, there are a couple of really interesting comments here in the in the chat. You know, I had never even heard of a derecho until earlier this year. Yeah. And, uh, so just that I remember specifically when that came through and uh, that actually took a good chunk of siding off the side of our house. So maybe that's why it's so fresh in my mind. But, um, you know, there are things like that that we've got to be aware of and maybe expanding our, our knowledge base and what is a uh, what is a disaster or what is a crisis and you, you mentioned mental health and I see Leela on here uh, had mentioned you know she had mentioned a couple of things like drug education and sexual assault those are other crises and and um, uh, and, and uh, disasters so to speak that we've got to be prepared for so I love that we're expanding uh, the things that we feel like we've got to be prepared for and we've got to have a plan in place to deal with that goes beyond fire and flood and and, and tornado so uh, yep. All really wonderful additions to uh, the pieces that we need to have included in our disaster preparedness plan. So thank you for the folks who are sharing that in the chat. I appreciate it. So we'll move on to the next slide, Woody. Let's talk about our yep. financial models. Yeah, and the one other point too in that, just real quick before we move to finances, is also sure. think about what keeps you up at night. Uh, is where we where we start with our clients in terms of do we have the resources? Do you know the number to the disaster restoration company you're going to use if you have a flood or a fire? Because and do you understand the services that your insurance provider provides? Because each of them have been out there negotiating on different uh, national providers and things of that nature. So do you know who you're going to call in that situation? Do you have a good plumber who can be there in the event that we have a quick leak from a hot water tank or a toilet? Uh, a good handyman that can be there after hours, different things like that. So make sure you have your, your resources in terms of your key vendor partners aligned as well when you're when you're dusting this thing off. Let's go to yeah, finances. That's idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. The other, you, you mentioned resources. One of the things that Steve and uh, the marketing team here at at CSL does a really good job of, and this is available to folks that are, whether you're a CSL customer or not, is they do a great job of keeping an eye on when severe weather is gonna hit a certain section of the country and making sure that, hey, we've got mess messages or emails out there uh, to the industry and the folks that are sitting in your chair that are aware of, hey, you've got severe weather coming your way, so just be aware and be prepared for it. So uh, lots of resources out there to take advantage of and lots of folks looking out for us. So let's yep. take advantage of all of those. Yeah, Talk about so, the financial house, Woody. Let's do it. Uh, you know, one of the things to keep in mind, you know, one of the largest assets that many either chapters, local house corporations, or national organizations have obviously is our house, right? The estimated value of the portfolio of real estate within the fraternity and sorority market is in the billions with a B of dollars, right? So there are a lot that goes with the managing and operations of these facilities. Some of our budgets are in the hundred to a half a hundred thousand to a half a million dollars. And then we have budgets that are north of a million dollars. And keep that in mind that most of small businesses, I think at the last time I looked and it's been years, understand, uh, understand that, but the, most of the small businesses in the United States, their annual revenue is less than a million dollars a large percentage. So we have fraternity and sorority houses whose annual revenue 
is at or even beyond most of the businesses in the United States. So it's really important that we take the time and ensure that our financial house is in order. So a couple of things that we, when we're introducing our thoughts and, and ideas related to the financial management of the facility, a couple of things that we like to talk about, there's not a silver bullet, right? There's not a silver bullet to that money tree that we all wish we had in the back that just kept growing millions and millions of dollars so that we can maintain these facilities. We have to do the put in the work. We have to manage it and manage the process uh, consistently in order to hit the goals and objectives that we want. It, a lot of times we get asked, why is money hard to find? I think it's un, I think it's really important that you understand the uniqueness of our industry, right? There's concerns regarding the asset preservation, right? On the men's side of the equation, unfortunately, we close a lot of chapters more than we're opening. So the those who are evaluating the risk of giving you money want to understand what are your contingencies if for some reason you are closed for a period of time. And, and what is it if our uh, chapter has to shut down? And it happens on the women's side as well. So there is that asset preservation concern, both as a vacant house, and then also what are you doing to invest back into it on a regular basis? Ownership structures can be complex, right? It's not just like buying a house or a commercial real estate. If you're a business, we have uh, ownership issues to where it's a local house corporation that's run by alum. Sometimes bankers uh, are not necessarily uh, keen or educated in how that works. If it's a national organization, how that works within the C Corps versus LLCs and the different shells and holding companies. There's complexity there that uh, certainly adds to some hesitation when these groups are evaluating to lend money to fraternities and sororities. Borrower has no history, right? And if you think about, for those of you that have been in the six in, in finance before or banking, the six C's the bankers look at. Uh, so there's character and, uh, and uh, consistent, no, consistency is not one of them, but uh, there's I'm drawing a blank on them right now, but they call them the six C's that are out there in the banking world. One of that that they're looking at is the consistency related to your paying uh, and the history of your paying your bills and stuff. A lot of these houses don't have debt. It's been a great thing uh, for our industry for a long period of time. Now that's changed in the last 15 or 20 years because of the growth and the demand that we've had to build our facilities. But by and large, we're not out there looking for credit. Our loans have supported it or we've sustained on our own. So that creates some challenges when we go out and we're looking to either go traditional finance versus fundraising. Uh, recommend, recommendations that we also say before, if you are looking uh, for money, so house director is important here that what we're trying to emphasize is some of these things that you see uh, house corporations are up against and trying to, in your role in terms of preserving that asset and getting the financial house in order. There are different, there are certain things that they may be coming to you with your knowledge and history and what things cost, because one of the things we got to develop that five-year capital plan. What are your sources and use of the money? What do you need it for? What do you want to do with that? Whether we're going to our alums for fundraising or going to a bank, they want to know what the money is for. And they want to be able to make sure that once that investment is made, what are we going to do to demonstrate operational excellence? And that comes in the roles of our house directors. That comes in the role of making sure we have key vendor partners that are going to preserve this asset appropriately moving forward. Scott, let's go to the next slide. Hey, I'm just to uh, jump in really quickly, Phil, for yeah. your lifeline there. So, uh, Phil, thanks for jumping in there. Character, capacity, capital, collateral conditions, and credit score. So, there you're six thank you. C. So, thank you, Phil. And uh, yep. one of the things that I, I would love to add to what you just said is that I think it's really important that the house directors there of all of us who are don't wear the hat that the student wears, they're the ones in the house every day, all day, every day. Yep. And so we have to have them engaged in these conversations and, may, and helping form these recommendations. So uh, I love the fact that you included them in that part of the conversation, because I think Way too often do we, we get it together as volunteers and, and you know, we, you know, we're, that, that's a really critical piece of information and insight that we could be gleaning from. So I love that you included house directors in that conversation because that's a critical piece to, to making a good decision in terms of what our recommendations should be going forward. So go ahead. Yep. So sources, uh, when we start talking about where are our sources, again, we would all love to have that money tree 
in the backyard that just keeps replenishing itself day in and day out. But common sources, alumni, right, fundraising, that is still uh, a, a big element to it. On the women's side, it tends to be a little more difficult than on the men's. We always talk about the fact that if the men could recruit members like the women and if the women could raise money like the men, we would have a billion dollar industry easily just in terms of cash flow. Uh, but our alums play a big part in terms of the financial success and, and the, still to this day remain a consistent source of revenue for us. National organizations certainly have uh, continued to build within their infrastructure opportunities and their foundations to try to support housing in a meaningful way and in the best possible way and certainly taking advantage of uh, tax deductibility when possible. Banks, banks uh, have certainly, I would say in the last 10 to 15 years, become a lot more comfortable in lending money to fraternities and sororities. They have more and more under, better understanding of our business and how things work. We've even seen some national banks that have been out there that have created divisions just related to student housing, uh, specifically for fraternities and sororities. Universities uh, certainly tend to be partners, uh, although that's becoming less and less right now. Obviously with the pandemic, strained budgets, states taking more budget money away from their public institutions versus pumping it in given budget constraints. So universities aren't really a great source right now, uh, but if it's certainly a piece of land that they would love to hold as for some point in the future, they may be willing to play ball. And then certainly free cash and reserves. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that here shortly uh, in terms of what we should be aiming for there. And then lastly, I just wanted to put a point here uh, for especially for everybody on the call, uh, but for our alums, it's not to forget about those programs that are out there from the IRS related to EGAP and CHIP, which are area grant uh, programs and then chapter house improvement plans, which one goes for the front end of the project, the other goes for the ongoing maintenance of those areas that are considered educational space. So not going to dive deep into it, but we just need to rem remember why we don't have the tax favorability that we ultimately hope to get one day through the work that's taking place at Washington and the uh, uh, Collegiate House Infrastructure Act and what we're trying to do there. Understand there are tax opportunities with these two programs that you can certainly be taking advantage of right now. Capital plans and projects, uh, the big thing right now, and especially in the environment, this is our time of year, October, November, when we start talking with our clients and working through their capital plans for the coming summer, right? So this is not a March and April scenario. And one of the main, two main reasons in that is that it takes longer now to move a project through all the hoops that we have to because of the uh, dynamics that are in the market but also understand our vendor partners by and large, the, especially in the construction industry are busier than ever. So if you're approaching them in late April or early May about your project that you wanna do in June, you're probably not gonna line them up. So make sure that you're starting your planning early in terms of your capital investments, make sure you're updating them regularly. If you haven't had a third party, look at the facility in a long period of time, whether you bring in a professional like us or even if you just invite an alum that may have volunteered 20 years ago to come to the house and walk it with you to see something that you may not be seeing, it's really important that you do that. And the last thing we'll say on capital planning is that it is difficult sometimes to prioritize because we may not want and understand that investing $40,000 into a new boiler may not help us on the recruitment side of things when we would love to invest $40,000 into our formal living room or dining room or doing a great TV gaming room or whatever it may be. So you do need to talk through those prioritizations and make sure you're getting the maximum return on investment, but deferring some of those critical items like boilers or roofs or things of that nature, if you defer too long, are gonna cost you more in the run. All right. Scott, let's go to the next slide. Couple questions so, for your group, Woody. Yep. I'm curious of everyone, and we have talked about this many times, so it's a little bit of a quiz. You know, how much should we be setting aside? So when we talk about reserving, I'm curious to see if anyone remembers uh, in terms of what we typically recommend uh, on that front. Or if you just want to take a guess, you don't even have to remember what we say. 
anybody gander and how much we should be setting aside when and what i'm talking about here is setting aside and reserving money for capital improvements in the future matthew's saying 25 percent. okay man that would be awesome yep any other guesses or dreams Dream, dreams are okay too <laughs> yeah i wish we could do this yeah 10 to 50 percent there you go. Minimum of 10. All right. Scott, I think we had a second question here too, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. No, let's let's flip it, right? This is how much we hope to save when we balance out our budget every year, how much we can be putting away. Uh, and these are great guesses that we have in there, but how much should we be charging? So when we talk about fees, again, something we've talked about several times in the last seven months, what do we should what should be our goal when we set our room and board rates? As as compared as a, to what? As a compared, sorry, thank you. As a percentage of the market, right? And you can consider the market the university room and board rates, you can consider the market apartments. But when we talk about as a percentage of our room and board rates, anybody remember what we should be aiming for in meeting that market value? While while those goals come in, uh, Woody, what what do we what do we typically see as compared to the industry average? Yeah, and and as they've come through, someone has answered the question right. Uh, and, and Leela in the ninety ninety five says so she's going to get a big A, and we'll talk about that. So yeah, let's go ahead and go to that next slide, Scott. But yeah, what we typically see on the men's side, market room and board rates is anywhere from 50 to 60 percent quite frankly uh so we, we we consider ourselves sometimes subsidized housing on the women's side i would say the average is more in the 70 80 percent so we do a little better job but the answer to that question as you see on this slide and the goal is 90 to 95 percent uh again we want to we're very price sensitive and we don't want to get people uh unable to enjoy this experience because they can't afford it Fraternity and sorority housing over the years has always been a great viable option on that front. And, and But we have to be sure that we're charging enough so that we can, as we note here, reserve at least 10% of our revenue every year. So whatever our revenue is, uh, before we spend it, hopefully we're able to set aside at least 10%. You may have also heard that we say, if you own the building, two and a half percent of the value of your building is another formula that some financial experts out there recommend as another option to put in there because as we've noted 20 every 20 to 30 years depending on wear and tear and sometimes it can be less you're essentially rebuilding that house right we're painting it we're replacing mechanical equipment we may have to replace the roof if it's a more of an asphalt shingle versus slate all these different things so we need to be prepared and be able to fund all of those needs over the next 20 or 30 years a few other points in terms of, as this slide suggests, thinking like an owner and, and in these assets and what we need to be keeping in mind, because yes, we're uh, a not-for-profit uh, organization out there, but we, again, need to make sure we're managing our facilities like a business so that we can preserve them for the future members and future uh, students that come through and join our organization and the experience that they have. We need to evaluate our contracts. I can't tell you even to this day, when we bring on new clients and we look about vendor agreements that are out there, we're getting contracts, we're trying to find contracts that were signed 20 years ago, 30 years ago on these washers and dryers or um, even copying machines and different things that lock you in for a long time. So if you haven't looked at your vendor agreements, something you need to do and, and reevaluate re them considerably. Audit your technology and, le and washer and dryer leases. That's another, there's even industries out there right now and companies out there that are coming in to large real estate portfolios and saying, hey, let us go in and audit your telephone lines, your cable, uh, all your utilities and different stuff and agreements that are out there. We're guaranteeing we can find you savings because what has happened is our house corporation boards may have changed leadership and a lot of those agreements don't get communicated or per, per, uh, perpetuated, excuse me, properly to the other so that they know when they come up or, hey, we have 
15 cable boxes when we actually only need two now because more people are streaming or whatever it may be. So take some time to look into those and engage your uh, house directors, your employees, and the members in the process. Again, the, the idea here is as we're going through this and we're looking at this, we know our house directors are on the front line, so they may have more visibility than maybe our volunteers. Members need to understand what these things cost, especially if we want them to buy into the process and understand why you're charging them the X when they damage something. They have no idea that a quality dining room chair, as we've dealt with some of our men's groups, unfortunately, felt like a dining room chair was great kindling for their fire outside, that that chair costs in excess of $250. They have no sense of that. So engaging them in the process will hopefully maybe have them think twice before they pull that chair outside to burn it, right? So those are just some key processes there. There are key mindsets. A lot of times we're operating in a vacuum and not inviting the right people to the discussion. So question for you to the group here, if you wanna get in the chat as well, what do we think is our largest expense typically for our houses, for a local house corporation, even their national organization? What do we think is a typical, the largest expense? that we're spending the most money on year in and year out in our houses. I'm eager to see the responses to this one. Got one response thing on insurance. What else are people thinking? Taxes? I'm gonna bet Doug is from uh, Champaign or Urbana. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. <laughs> Mortgage, Mortgage, HVAC improvements. He's from Chicago, by the way. So yes, okay. we guessed right. We were, we're in the same area, property tax. So what it is, Scott, let's go drum roll. It's really our food. Now, that's probably not a fair statement to some of you because sometimes the food expense is held under the chapter and not necessarily the house corporation. So for those of you who do not have food within your house corporation budget, yes, mortgage taxes uh, are typically where you're gonna see uh, a, large, a large portion of your expenses going or the insurance. So to be fair, we do wanna qualify, but we do more, more more often than not, we see that food is falling within our house corporation's roles and responsibilities, given the, uh, to the very much to the point that it costs the amount of money that it does. It's just a, a whole different game than when the men or women in the chapter uh, in complexity could ever, could handle it on their own. So let's just shift for a minute and talk through food service because we wanted to highlight this um, and we, Again, we're going to go through this quickly because we have a lot to cover, but we wanted to highlight food primarily from the standpoint of it can make such a huge impact to the experience of the folks that are uh, that are living in your facilities. I know our house directors on the call understand this, and I'm sure many of our volunteers, but we can tell you many, many stories where we have seen that going in and improving the food services within our facilities has made a dramatic impact in the number of members that we're recruiting to the number of our members that want to live in our resource or in our residence. So meal plan management, let's just talk a little bit about that in terms of our source of food service providers. Um, we're going to, the, the various types we'll talk about in the next slide, but what we have seen in the past and what we've been recommending when we first started the company, kitchen management companies and bringing in an outside third party was pretty expensive. Uh, and we, we sometimes look and we should be looking at uh, our food service as a possible profit center, right? We, we, if we can make money, that would be a, a great opportunity. And it was very difficult early on with kitchen management companies because of just the cost metrics. They have certainly improved their game on that. And we would uh, encourage you if you've never considered them to look at it because we, we feel like the benefits of what they bring to the table, especially if you can still uh, uh, pull from it a little bit of profit outweigh not having them there. Um, in terms of reinvesting, Scott, did you have something to throw in there? Nope, nope. I'll oh, head on. Okay. You're good. All right. So, uh, food, again, is one of the points I made, reinvesting back in the house, right? So, we know when we have good food service, we we're providing a great experience there. We're going to see more and more people willing to uh, show up and, and, and live in the house and enjoy the experience that's there. 
we need to make sure we're evaluating the performance of our food often, especially now when we have a lot of food allergies. We certainly have members with higher expectations. You know, it's not necessarily just the comfort food, but I think you do need to be mindful of what region of the country that you live in. Uh, the students that are going to the South want to eat differently than the students that may be going to California, or Oregon. It's just the reality of it. So we need to make sure we're communicating and talking through uh, what we're serving and being intentional about the experience that's happening in that. We uh, talk about experience greatly and we feel like the kitchen and the dining, uh, the food, all that elements creates uh, a great opportunity to make sure the fraternal uh, experience that you want to come alive in your house is coming and using it as a selling point. And let's not have our cell phones in there. Uh, let's make sure that we're having opportunities. Maybe I know out of a COVID environment, when we get back to hopefully a normal environment where we can have family style dining or plated meals versus just our buffets and things of that nature. Next slide, Scott. Um, kitchen operations, again, I wanna, I'm gonna speed up because uh, we're already running long on time, but what works best for you? Do you still need a chef? A lot of people still employ uh, their cooking staff, which is totally fine. Kitchen management firms are a great opportunity. We see less and less on the catering front, just from a cost standpoint. And then some folks, they just don't offer food uh, because they don't have the capabilities or, or the room to do it within their facilities. Keep in mind, food can, again, be our best selling point, but can be our one of our worst as well. So we got to make sure that we're providing healthy meals and good meal service, and it requires commitment and communication. Those are key elements to ensuring that our food operations are being successful, whether you have employees or whether you're using a kitchen management company. Scott, next slide. Yeah, this is where I take over, but I'll, I'll, I'll yep. wrap up that section. If there are two things that I, I well, I'm, there are two places where I would definitely recommend people invest when we kind of talk about this financial, getting your financial house in order. Man, if we, if you can find a way to invest in a kitchen management company and a house director, man, what that just, that's a game changer for your, uh, for your facility. Get total game changer, uh, kitchen management, house director. Oh man, game changers. So let's talk about your team. Uh, so Scott, just real quick, because yeah. I was looking at chat and I know because of our time, I want to make sure we get some of these points if we, if we run low on it. But you know, there's a great point in here in the chat talking about somebody that doesn't have a kitchen uh, and you want to have food service in your house and maybe have some meals brought in from time to time. Uh, there's a comment and it's a great recommendation. Look at your other chapters on campus and if they are providing food service and if they are using a kitchen management company outside of maybe just getting meals from your local restaurant or caterer or whatever that may be fairly expensive. Uh, the comment that was put in there, you know, talk to those local uh, kitchen management companies that are working in the chapter houses because they may be willing to provide meals for you as well. That's a great recommendation that I just wanted to point out. No, that's a great one because I'm thinking about uh, like the, the facility we lived in. We did not have a commercial kitchen, and uh, but a couple of times a year we would have a full chapter meal uh, catered in, and I, those were what some of my favorite nights of the year. Uh, and I would love, you know, and and it was difficult to pull together. It was the only reason we didn't. We only did it a couple of times a year. So if you, yep. it's become so much easier to do now. So please take advantage of, uh, advantage of those opportunities and the accessibility of that experience for your members if you don't have. A commercial kitchen in your facility. So let's talk about our teams and uh, just want to share really quickly some of the things that we see out in the field. Um, oftentimes we see confusion outweighing uh, the clarity, which is uh, regardless of what you're talking about, that is uh, that is an issue. So uh, from from boundaries of the the chain of command, we we absolutely need we need absolute clarity uh we have to help everybody understand exactly what their lane is and and how to stay in it so uh, specific to number two on the on the screen here uh, we often see house corporations relying way too heavily on house directors now uh, this is a really capable willing bunch of folks uh, many of whom are on the call today but um, we can't expect them to rally to tasks that aren't within their job description if we haven't at least had a conversation so House corporations, uh, we want to really encourage you to please make sure your team, um, as well as your house director, is really clear on what uh, what is their lane, how to stay in it, and how to thrive in it. So, 
let's let's make sure let's flip the scales on that and make sure that clarity starts to outweigh the confusion that we oftentimes see. And I would add to uh, specifically to number four, uh, if we're going to ask house directors to perform at a really high level, let's make sure that we're equipping them. Uh, we rarely see house corporations adequately invest uh, in the professional development of house directors. Now, we don't believe that's because um, anyone's super budget conscious or they don't want their house director to have access to those opportunities. Oftentimes, it's just because the house corporation may not know what's available out there. So. For those of you who serve on a, a local house corporation, we really want to encourage you to, to reach out to your headquarters, to reach out to your campus, um, find out what opportunities might be available uh, at little or no cost uh, to help your house director be set up for success. So uh, learn what those opportunities are for growth um, because these are the people who are the eyes and ears of your facility. And if we are building into them in really impactful ways that we know that that facility is gonna be really, really well run. So uh, you'll be glad you did. Uh, and your house director will be set up for success in, in the process. So just a couple things to think about in terms of uh, really investing in uh, the development of your team that is there locally within the facility. So uh, that screen was really about uh, talking to those that do have a house director. So for those of you who don't, uh, let me speak to you for a second. So the first four points, I'm not sure I can say it any more clearly. If you if you don't have a house director, would encourage you to invest in a house director. If I didn't say that clearly enough, I would encourage you to invest in a house director. If you don't have a house director, would really encourage you to think about changing your stance on that. So uh, just we, it's it's imperative that we find find money in our budget to to make that investment. So. That's uh, it's simply not wise and and frankly impossible to think that uh, it's a it's a good decision to have 18 to 21 year olds living in these multi million dollar facilities without an adult nearby. So um, in addition to that, I would just encourage you to to vet your vendor partners um, uh, thoroughly and uh, make sure that you've got clear expectations for their performance and that uh, that they understand exactly what you're expecting during your relationship with them. So. With that being said, I do have a question for the group. Um, what's out there? Uh, when you think about your house directors and their experience and their, their professional development and training, what are some of the areas or what are some of the, the opportunities that you've seen available to house directors uh, for professional development? Hop in the chat and let us know where you go to invest in your house directors so we can make sure everybody has uh, some idea on where to go to to provide some resources and some development opportunities there. Where do you guys go? Scott, while... Sure. Scott, I want to jump in while they're answering those that question for you and just highlight two points um, on the past slide in terms of building their team, right? So a couple of things on house directors. What we have found that if you house at least 25 to 30 folks in your facility, to be able to at least on a part-time basis be able to afford a house director. I also think it's important, I was watching the chat as you were speaking, someone was making a comment regarding uh, it's so key to get a the right fit for the management companies with great success. I would say it's the same for our house directors in getting that right fit and sometimes yeah. house directors admit it's not the right fit and, and house corporations don't but it's also all of our vendor partners that we are making sure we have the right vendor partner, the right house director for our facility. We're holding each other accountable, we're reviewing performance regularly. That's how we lead, that's how we build a great team. I just wanted to emphasize that. Love that, that's great. So um, I, it's, it's, I, I love seeing a couple of the responses here. I was talking about at Oklahoma State, they actually require a live-in house director for, for all the uh, chapters there. And um, I love that, uh, Jenna's giving a shout out to her. Jana's giving a shout out to her house director. So that's great to see that encouragement. So for those of you who are a little bit uh, that, that may be looking for opportunities to build into your house director, to give them opportunities for professional development, here are a few opportunities. Um, that, first off, your organization probably has opportunities uh, to build into your house directors for, for their training and development. Your industry partners likely do. You know, you've got access to the house and home series with us. Uh, we've got the Fraternal House Directors Conference is coming up next summer. Um, 
you've got a lot of different opportunities. We know some organizations like Tri Delta and Alpha Chi Omega, who are partners of ours, they, you know, they offer house director training for their house directors that are on their staff. So you've got a lot of different places where you can go uh, for for training. So I, I do have uh, Shelly Sutherland. Are you on the call today? Let me script flip through here. See if Shelly's on with us. I didn't see her, Scott. Yeah, I'm, no, oh, I'm no, here. There oh, are. great. Great. Shelly, can I put you on the spot really quickly and just ask, you spent your entire career on a campus. Uh, what were the, where were the places and what were the resources that uh, you would make sure that your house directors knew about, that your local house corporations knew about? Uh, what were the main things, that, main programming opportunities you tried to seek out and make sure that they were aware of? What, where was, what was the guidance you gave there? Um, I think the there are three things that I did that were probably the top of the list. One is that I met on a monthly basis or every other month sometimes with house corporation people. And we met in Eugene and then we repeated the meeting in Portland so that we got everybody. And we had topics, the similar topics to what you're doing. We wanted everybody to exchange information and ideas about how they were running and what worked and what didn't, best practices. We also did that with alums in, in recruitment season with uh, recruitment advisors in both Portland and Eugene, which is a lot of work, but you get a whole lot of information. My favorite activity, however, was the having a house director monthly meeting and taking the house directors to different departments at the university. So we, we visited the counseling center, the health center, the um, security and fire safety people, and learned from them all the different ways they work for the university but I was fortunate enough to work for a university that truly believed the fraternities and sororities were valuable assets. So it made it easy to share. And Woody, when you were talking about the finances, I would suggest that either the advisor, chapter advisors or house corps or house directors set up a meeting with residence halls and go eat a meal in the residence hall, tour the residence hall, find out what their programming is, what, what activities they have, um, what their rules and regulations are, and how much it costs to live there. And then you can make a much more um, comfortable decision about what rent you're gonna charge your members. Great, Love great that. recommendation, yep. yep. Yeah, so there are a ton of resources available uh, to us. And just oftentimes we just don't know about them. So, Shelly, thanks for sharing that. And I just want to encourage everybody on the group on the call to uh, reach out to your national international organization, reach out to us, or reach out to your campus, and find out what opportunities there are for training and development uh, for your house director or. Uh, even for your vendor partners. I mean, I think it's, we, we are a different type of community. So when we're inviting people into our homes, it's really important that they understand what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, and kind of the culture of our organization so that they can serve us at a high level and that, so that they can meet our expectations. So uh, with that being said, let's get into some of the basics that uh, some of the blocking and tackling that we oftentimes fail to focus on because it's it's really easy to be distracted and uh, sometimes we forget about some of the fundamentals. So what do you want to ask you to dive into some of the things that, um, you know, let, let's, what are some of the things that we need to know that, that maybe we don't know? So talk to us about the need to know. Well, first, I feel like I'm in a presidential debate because I'd like to go back to the previous question for a minute, if you don't mind, <laughs> before I get into this one. Uh, okay. No, but real quick, just looking at the chat, there were two good points on this one that uh, Shannon Smith had made. And I wanted to, one is that they invite their house director to their monthly calls for the boards. I think that's really important. If you need to go into executive discussion and ask them to uh, leave the call or the meeting, that, that's certainly appropriate as well. But including them in those, I thought was a great idea. And then again, emphasizing our vendor partners like our food 
companies and, and others that are out there that service the insurance uh, folks as well, they all have great opportunities for you to build into your house directors from a training standpoint. So it's not, there's, there's just so much out there that if you even wanted to do it just for your house director, look to your kitchen management company, look to who your organization uses for insurance and look to your organization and those three areas and the university, let's not forget them, those areas right there, boom, you've got so much training for them. Uh, you'd be amazed. Scott, let's go back to the basics. So real quick, running through just some basics here that we want to make sure the idea here, when we look at a facility and we're working with house directors and we're working with house corporations, like just do you know the basics of your facility? What are the things that you guys need to know or your vendor partners team need to know in terms of uh, the building and so that you can properly maintain it and secure it throughout any situation, right? So a couple of fundamentals. Do we know how to shut off the power, uh, the gas and the water to the house? Now, we always put a caveat to power because we don't necessarily want people running in and hitting that big switchboard in the house because you could do some really major damage to the facility. But again, understanding the power components, breaker boxes, things of that nature is critical. Shut off for gas water, shut offs for our water heaters, toilets, washing machines, we can't tell you countless times and, and understanding even the members and residents come to our house. We've worked with house directors who had mainly run, maybe have run off to the store and we're dealing with a crisis because a member has flooded a toilet uh, and they can't, uh, they even don't know how to talk, turn it off at the source, right? So that's a really important key. Location of access points, attics, roofs, crawl spaces. If anything, not only just from a safety standpoint, but uh, one of the first houses we brought on and one of my first visits when I uh, got to partner with Steve, I was at a house, we're in a crawl space, a ladies uh, facility, a women's chapter house. I'm sitting there with the house director we're in the basement. It's the access to uh, the crawl space off of the basement. She's like, oh, I didn't even know that existed. Uh, didn't even know it was there. And I walk in and I, or I don't walk and I open the door and I, you, you can almost walk into it. It was pretty big. I'm like, man, this is the cleanest crawl space I've ever seen. Like I've never seen a crawl space this clean. And it was dirt, but it was still really clean. And there was a massive rock in it. And I walk around this rock and there is a mattress, sheets, and you name it in there. And so that crawl space was being used obviously for something. So as house directors and stuff, our students get creative, right? So it's important that you know where these areas are that you or someone, whether it's the, the handyman or, or you, uh, typically we don't want people up on ladders, but we're checking these areas and we're making sure that they're safe and they're not being used inappropriately. Next slide, Scott. Uh, in terms of emergency planning, right? We've already visited about this a little bit, but what contacts are in your bedside table for 24 seven support? Again, if you talk about peace of mind, and we can go ahead to the next slide, Scott, when we talk about peace of mind and where we're going, you know, these are the vendor partners that we wanna make sure that we have readily available when we're supporting our house directors and supporting our house corporations. Plumber, electrician, a good HVAC mechanical guy, uh, disaster restoration team, and the property management like us, if applicable, and if you are able to, to bring that in from a financial standpoint. but. <laughs> The key being too, not only are they available, uh, you need to have the conversation about their after hour support. A lot of times we may have these people and they say, oh, by the way, we're not uh, interested in um, coming to your house at three o'clock in the morning. And sometimes you need that. So make sure you're having that conversation. Next slide, Scott. A uh, couple of other just nuggets, if you will, that we have learned in the heat of the battle or a crisis or whatever, like, man, we really wish you knew where all the electrical boxes are. How many electrical boxes have been uh, in uh, breaker boxes, if you will, have been hidden behind a composite or a picture? And we're trying to figure out that one breaker that has blown. Uh, pilot lights uh, can be our friend and can be a really pain in the butt on our gas uh, gas stoves and when we have gas smells, oftentimes it's a pilot light issue. Uh, contract and contact information for our key vendors. Again, sometimes our house directors don't know what the contract states, right? If we're asking our house directors to manage 
what um, that vendor partner should be doing. Do they know the frequency of cleaning? Do they know the terms of when they should be cleaning what or the lawn, lawn care or whatever it may be? And the general knowledge of our HVAC boiler systems, on and off switch, safety things of that nature. So almost thinking about when you bought your house and you, if it was a brand new house and you're going through the contractor and they're doing that owner training, you almost at least uh, every few years, uh, if not yearly, if you can, going through these items and making sure that we can check these boxes and we know where these things are. Scott, next slide. Uh, life safety code compliance requirements is a big piece. Preventive maintenance chapter calendar. This is a big one that we want to talk about too, because oftentimes we'll bring in new house directors and they don't maybe know the uniqueness of that chapter and chapter events. And, and distinctively as house court volunteers, we think, well, the chapter advisor will tell them or the undergraduate member in that role will tell them and it doesn't get communicated and they wake up on a Saturday and it's parents weekend. They had no idea it happened. So let's make sure we're viewing chapter calendar of events. On this slide, that's a big one that we'd like to uh, point out. And then also guest and visitor policies. This is probably more germane to our women's facilities, but do we have a clear understanding as house directors and does the chapter have a clear understanding what the guests and visitor policies are of the house corporation and the organization and when and where uh, people can be in the house? Of course, in a pandemic, not as a, a big of a scenario, but something that we see when we're talking through uh, with house directors and with our new clients, these are things that are typically miscommunicated or missed altogether. Scott, next slide. So we're gonna shift here. Uh, what we've tried to do last week and then up to this point is again, we're dusting off our house corporation hat right and all the basics and what we should be doing day in and day out as a house corporation in support of our facility and partnering with our local staff and partnering with our national organizations and partnering with our university right so we have to look inward uh and we we try very much to to move forward and we try very much to look outward but we were just talking before this call we had a strategy call and we think about within our company and we were talking about all the different things that come at us as an industry and what organizations are facing and what our local chapters are facing and what the environments in which we operate in are, are tough and, and a lot of times we don't get a lot of opportunity to to look to the future and do planning and figure out how we can make this facility great and do all the different things that we want to in terms of the experience that's unfolding in that house, right? Uh, because we get distracted or we get pulled in all these directions because of a pandemic or a disaster or a crisis or a university event or an organization. I mean, there's just so much. So we're gonna shift here, give it back to Scott. And one of the things that we're really committed to and, and working with our clients with and, and, and anybody that we have an opportunity to talk to is about the experience and some of the, the tools and techniques and ideas that we share. So Scott, I'll give it back to you. Awesome, thank you, Woody. Well, uh, last week and even on uh, in some of the chats we've seen today, uh, we kept hearing uh, either directly or a theme of, gosh, how, how do we just get people to live in the house? How do we get people to wanna to live in the house? So uh, we wanted to spend some time today talking about that. So I, I'm gonna ask you guys to, uh, I think like Walt Disney uh, for a few minutes. And uh, let's talk about doing things so well that uh, that people, our members specifically, will want to see us do it, uh, whatever it is. Uh, they'll want to see us do it again. And more importantly, they will want to bring their friends along. So let's uh, let's take a Disney approach to uh, the, the next few minutes of our, of our conversation. So, um, Let's specifically talk about um, delivering a world-class customer experience. You know, we, we wanna encourage uh, you to think about your residents, uh, your members as customers, as customers. Uh, if, if we want them to want to move into our houses, into our homes, and we want them to encourage others to do the same, we've gotta turn our customers into fans. We gotta turn our fans into advocates who will, with a megaphone, tell people, my gosh, this is an amazing place I live in and you should consider it. So 
uh, what that's going to require for many of us is a complete shift in terms of how we view students because way too often especially i would say on the men's side and uh and allow me to kind of kick ourselves a little bit here is we think we're doing these guys some big favor by giving them this this big house to live in um but uh really you know they at the end of the day they are our customers and we have to start thinking about them as such because they're paying us a lot of money to live in these facilities so what can we do to shift the way we see them uh start looking at them from a more customer centric perspective how do we get those customers turned into fans and how do we get those fans turned into advocates who are willing to go out and uh, advocate for our, our experience and what we have to offer in these facilities. So we want to talk for a second about the customer experience. For some of you who are really, that might be a new term for you. Uh, if so, really the Harvard Business Review review or really uh, defines it and summarizes it as the sum total of all your interactions with a company. So think about it. If you've visited a website or you've gotten into a chat conversation with a customer service rep or maybe you've had somebody knock on your door and uh say introduce themselves because they're a you know a local landscaping company or maybe you've gone online and purchased something or you followed a company that you admire or you want to know more about on social media or you've done something crazy like actually go into a brick and mortar store and purchase something from a real life person all of those interactions all of those experiences with that brand the sum total of them that makes up the customer experience so uh, i would love for you to think about something for just a second um who are the brands that the companies that you uh, uh that you make purchases from that you uh that you follow religiously you know who are those brands that you are fiercely fiercely loyal to and why who are those brands? Hop into the chat really quickly and tell me who are the brands that you are fiercely loyal to? And if you wanna add why, that'd be great too. So who are the brands you're fiercely, fiercely loyal to? I will tell you, I've been doing uh, this workshop. Uh, you're getting the five minute version of about a two or three hour workshop right now, by the way. And the first time we discussed this as a company, uh, Woody had asked me to share at a company meeting. This is going on four or five years ago now. And um, how much time do you have? Do I have? He says you got an hour. Well, uh, we started talking about this as a company, and four hours later, I'm still going, and our company's still going. We're still talking about this. So it was a, you know, this is this is um, an important conversation for us to have. And again, you're getting the, the the four minute version of it or the, the five minute version of it. Well, some of the brands that kept popping up in our conversations were Chick-fil-A and Target and Southwest Airlines. And it's funny as we've continued to do this workshop and taking it to the outside the, the company, uh, some of those names continue to, to be uh, shared by the people that are in our audiences. I love that David Friedman here added Target and Tra Trader Joe's, uh, two common brands we hear of often. Um, I take one I'll add to the group uh, is Zappos, uh, and I'll add Amazon to that uh, to that list as well. You know, you're going to get um, get what you need when you need it, uh, reliably, dependably, quickly. And if you have a customer service issue, they take care of your issues really, really quick. They're easy to do business with. So I love this. Sean has added uh, Southwest Airlines and Hyundai. Also, uh, those are two great brands that people often bring up Wegmans I don't know who Wegmans is Robin so I love that that is a local brand for you probably because oftentimes a lot of what we learn from best is our local brands because there's a lot riding on local brands because they've got to serve the local community really really well or they uh that's their success and livelihood is depending on serving the local community really really well love some Publix is a really common one. So I love all of these answers we're seeing here. So uh, what I, one of the reasons why we want people to think about those brands that they're fiercely loyal to is because we want you to start thinking about, okay, what are those similar fundamentals that they put in place um, that keep me coming back? How can we replicate those uh, with our own experience that we're providing the students that live in our facilities. So 
I do have a, a follow-up question to this. So what if our goal was to provide a world-class customer experience? How, you know, how would that change the way we, uh, we do business? How would that change the way our students view living in the facility? Uh, what would that make capacity look like? Uh, would revenue continue to be an issue for us? Or would we want people living in our facilities and banging down the door to live in our facilities? You know, how much easier would your job be? Would you continue to have to pull teeth to get members to live in? How much easier would it be to recruit volunteers to support that experience? So uh, just would love for you to uh, think about that in terms of, man, how much better would our lives be as volunteers and house directors and even campus professionals if we were providing a world-class customer experience to the members who call our chapter houses homes? So it takes a little bit of a shift, but wouldn't that be, um, be amazing? So um, again, I mentioned a, a second ago, you're getting the five minute version of a two or three hour workshop here. So if you're interested in going deeper on this, I'd be happy to have a conversation on the side and, and talk about what we can do to make that happen. But uh, for today, we wanted to at least introduce the concept because one of the things that we see with high performing house corporations uh, and how and and high performing brands is they have this customer centric um, posture that they maintain. Uh, the house corporations that we see that don't have a problem with capacity, uh, that have an active culture and community within their house, they're the ones who are asking their students, okay, what do you want out of this experience? And then they're finding ways to provide it uh, in big and small ways. We talked a little bit about that last week when we talked about the reimagining spaces, their students' needs are different today than they were when we were in school. So uh, I wanna encourage you to ask your students what they need out of that experience because the, the house corporations that are doing that, they're thriving and they're not getting distracted by uh, the noise that we oftentimes get distracted by on our way up the top, to the top of the mountain. So. I just want to encourage you to give that consider that that can cons some consideration um because it's important for us to always remember that uh, every member living in our facility is is a customer uh is one of our members and most importantly that that those members that are living in our facilities that's somebody's son or daughter uh that's somebody's grandson or granddaughter that's somebody's brother or sister niece or nephew uh we've got to serve and support and care for those people accordingly and and if we do if we do that really really well if we serve them extraordinarily well we will continue to see tributes like this uh cemented into the front porches of our chapter houses we'll continue to see our chapter members or our chapters recruiting the best and brightest on our campuses and we'll continue to see these lifelong friendships like the one on your ones on your screen right now continue to to evolve so um when we're providing a world-class customer experience for the members that are living in our houses, not only is that good for them then, but it's great for our organizations over the long term. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward, because we see the high-performing chapter houses, or, or excuse me, house corporations. Uh, that's one of the things that they really, that they're really, really extraordinary at. So let's talk about what now and start to, to start to wrap up. Um, yep. One of the things we would encourage you to do, uh, again, is to be consistently critical of, um, of, of your operations and con consistently critical about how you're living out some of the essentials that we have shared the last two weeks. Evaluate your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, frequently. I've got on the slide here each semester. If you can get together, because we talked about how much easier it is to get together as a team to do that, uh, let's do it more frequently than that because the dynamics within our facilities are changing rapidly and so it's important for us to be nimble enough to adapt to those changes as well. So Woody, last uh, last week you talked about there were really three different types of scenarios that we see in terms of house corporations. So give some recommendations in terms of next steps depending on where you are right now. Yeah, so last week we focused on the kind of the dire strait, right? We can't find anybody. We don't have any volunteers. The house national organization is scrambling. So as we wrap up today and look at this, the, the two most commonly we see is that we have uh, coming in is the uh, an experienced house corporation that is trying to 
possibly perpetuate and move forward uh, with the next generation of le leadership. And we're very well versed. We have our stuff kicked into a pile. We got things going. So when you're when you're operating in that capacity and things are going great, it is important to understand if you have a perpetuation plan. What are you doing to develop the next generation of volunteers to fill your shoes when you leave? And have you done the right stuff in terms of our record keeping? Uh, a lot of times back in the day, if you remember, you get the old banker's box. Here's all of our paperwork as they were perpetuating. Now we have so many tools and resources and technologies. Make sure even if you've got your game going uh, in all cylinders clicking at one time and you're going to great guns a blazing, make sure that you are doing the proper record keeping and that you are investing in others. And at the end of the day, where are we doing in terms of our capital and where are we doing in terms of, of tracking and investing into our facility appropriately to make sure it's gonna be well maintained and available to others. And if you need to look at a third party and get their opinion moving forward, that is something that uh, you may wanna invest in and look at uh, as you uh, continue to move forward. The second one, Scott, if we go to the next slide, as we see, we're, we're new, right? We have new volunteers that are coming in. Where do we begin? We're excited. We want to take on the world. Uh, we want to do all these wonderful things. We would encourage you just to take a breath, begin at the beginning, and make sure that the, you have things uh, that need to be taken care of in these check boxes that we've just talked about the last two days. Uh, what uh, is going on and what we need to do to make sure that if we have any big fires going on, potential fires that may need attention right away, uh, if we don't have resources, if you were brought in and it wasn't like we were talking about the last slide, a, a group of folks that had everything kicked into a pile, you were just brought in because you were willing to show up. Uh, if that's the case, make sure you got your resources. Look to your national organization, look to your insurance providers, resources like our website and things of that nature to catch your breath, make sure you've got the main issues resolved, and then you can start moving forward with really the exciting stuff, which probably got you there in terms of investing in those members and investing in that facility. Scott, next slide. So, a couple of last thoughts here. We gotta stay the course, volunteering, and I think for our house directors to understand one of the big things that we see in the industry right now and the reason Steve started this company and looking at this is that finding that next generation of volunteers to do what many on this call do day in and day out is difficult. These are challenging times. These are challenging facilities uh, by, all straight, by all factors. If you think about whether you have a new house or old house, it's just different than what it was 20 or 30 years ago. So we really wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to invite that next generation of volunteers. Whether you have a company like us, whether you have a house director, national organization, whatever, all of these resources are coming to the table, kitchen management companies, all these different opportunities are to complement the role of that volunteer. Because at the end of the day, we know the most successful chapters that are out there uh, and the most successful facilities that are out there day in and day out are ones where they have a very active and engaged house corporation, advisor core, and if they are able and if it's appropriate, a strong house director. When you have those elements going in and it's complemented by organizations like us and the kitchen management companies and great insurance partner, et cetera, it's just amazing. So we wanna make sure that that's taking place and those things are happening day in and day out. And make sure that we're, uh, you know, also utilize the tools that are provided. Uh, we've talked about that as we've gone into the pandemic and everything that we have going on. Look to your headquarters, look to our website, look to all the vendor partners that are here and available and make sure that you're utilizing those uh, because you're not in this alone moving forward. Scott, let's go to the next slide. Love that. So, well, let's let's start wrapping up here and talk about, you know, hey, if you start, if you implement these essentials we've been talking about, here's what's gonna happen for you. Our houses are gonna be more competitive, they're gonna be safer, we're gonna have satisfied volunteers and we're gonna be more financially secure because we're uh, filling the house is no longer an issue. Uh, so, but most importantly, we're gonna have an improved student experience and we're gonna have parents who are gonna be endorsing this experience. So uh, there's a lot to be said for just putting in some of the basic blocking and tackling we've talked about uh, the last couple of weeks. So. Um, 
I'm going to hop over to the chat, see if there's any remaining uh, questions and answer or questions that we need to answer. Uh, so, and I know we've gone a little bit over today. So uh, while we're doing that, while Woody's doing that, actually, uh, a couple of opportunities I want to remind people of, uh, again, put on your radar screen, uh, coming up next June, we'll be back uh, with the Fraternal House Directors Conference in, in Denver. So want to put that on your radar. And then next week, we're actually going to jump into uh, talking about closing time, preparing for this extended break. We know a lot of our schools are closing down after Thanksgiving. Uh, so the break is going to be extended. So we want to make sure that we've got the right fundamentals in place uh, to ensure that we've closed the house properly for uh, this extended period of time where there won't be any students living in it. So we'll be dumping, jumping into that uh, next Friday, same time. So uh, Woody, do you see anything in the Q&A that uh, we haven't addressed yet that we might want to, to touch on? Well, we just had one that came from Phil, the CSL have a cheat sheet checklist uh, for much of uh, what was covered today. So uh, there are, uh, and again, I would go to the housing hub on our website. There's a lot of different tools and resources, Phil, that are available there that you're, that you're free to have, uh, depending on who your insurance partner is as well. They have a ton of those. And if there's anything specifically uh, that you're looking for that's not there, uh, let us know and we'll be happy to to share it with you on a lot of these different topics that we covered. Yeah, Phil, the other thing I would add to that, sorry to interrupt Woody, but uh, we'll make the recording available uh, on Monday. So you should be receiving the court re recording as well. So you can kind of fast forward through the slides uh, and if, the, if that helps provide additional resources as well. So let's like Richard's got a, a question here, Woody. Yep, regarding about utilities. Uh, so, Richard, it really depends. I don't know if there's, I would say more often than not on the men's side of the equation, we see a, a the house corporation structured where the house corporation basically has a lease with the chapter and that house corporation is focused on real estate, uh, taxes, insurance, and any major needs of the facility. And they're asking the chapter to take care of all the day-to-day -day operational expenses and paying them and, and handling that. Now we're seeing it creep more and more over to the house corporation again, just like it is f difficult to find volunteers willing to jump in and do some of the work that is required for our houses. We're also seeing that finding undergraduate members that have the time and capacity because they're so programmed to go through as a treasurer and take care of these things it just takes a lot of a higher level uh, of accountability, if you will, in it. Fortunately, there are technologies like Omega Phi and Bill Highway and other stuff that are helping there. But I would say more often than not, on the men's side of the equation, the chapter is taking care of day-to-day -day expenses. On the women's, it's probably 50-50 just because of where they are and how they set up their facilities. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm not seeing anything we haven't covered so let's uh let's wrap up so uh last week we covered a lot we've thrown literally everything but the kitchen sink at you so you know last week we were we dove into uh campus and student trends uh we gave you some starting points to consider jumped in some of the foundational components and uh and then you know what happens if we need to hit reset and then and this week we dove in um talking about disaster recovery and getting our financial house in order and you know the impacts of implementing all of these essentials that, that we've been uh, we've been discussing. So uh, our goal here was to help people start stop playing checkers and start playing chess. Uh, so we hope that uh, sometime along the last two weeks, these two sessions, that you picked up a few fundamentals, a few essentials that you hadn't considered before, that enable you to kind of move the needle in that direction. So. Uh, with that being said, I just want to encourage you guys to stay in touch. If there's a question that pops up along the way, uh, please reach out to us. We are here, uh, ready, willing, and able to answer your questions. We want to make sure that we come alongside you uh, on this journey. Uh, we're all doing hard work, but it's work that matters. And uh, we need you to know that we want to be your partner and come alongside you in that process. So with that being said, I'll just say thank you again for joining us the last two weeks. Uh, really grateful for all that you guys have done, for making some time to be here, and for all that you continue to do for the men and women that call our chapter houses home. We are so grateful for you. So thanks again for making some time today, and we'll see you next time on the next episode of House and Home. Take care, everyone.